Hey, what's up, you guys? And welcome back to the Televised Podcast. My name is Anna, and today we're going to be talking about Supergirl Season 6, Episode 8, titled Welcome Back, Kara. Long time no see. Um, <laughs> long time no see. I know it's been a minute, but I uh, just wanted to kind of like take a break and chill um, before Supergirl comes back, so that's what I did. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed the premiere. I know that I did. I, I really liked this episode, and obviously we're going to talk about that a lot, about the things that I really liked and thought worked really well for this episode. Um, I think it kind of sits in the same vein as some of the other episodes that that we've seen this season where I've talked about, like, just thinking that they are kind of going back to basics, back to the stuff that, like, makes this show good and the stuff that we want to see from this show. You know, focusing on characters that we care about, focusing on elements that we care about, and I think this episode kind of, like, you know, exemplified that in a way that I think worked really well and was just really successful in doing that, and also just kind of, like, keeping the excitement going about and and maybe even reigniting the, the excitement uh, for the second half of this season, because obviously it was a little bit inconvenient to have, like, this giant break right in the middle of their final season, but they're back and will be running every single week, as far as I, I know, as far as we all know, um, until November 9th, I believe, is the final uh, day that Supergirl will be airing. And then we actually just found out, too, that the next week after that, November 16th, Tuesday, November 16th, will be uh, the beginning of the Flash crossover. I think it's supposed to be, what, like a five-episode event? Or maybe I'm wrong on that, but <laughs> or like four or five part event where it's it's kicking off the the season of the Flash, but it's a crossover, kind of like replacing some of the crossovers that we've come to know uh, that have taken place, you know, normally like at the mid season point, but now it's taking place right at the beginning to kick off the Flash, and actually Alex Danvers will be a part of it, which is really cool. And I'm so excited to see Kyler, you know, put back on her Sentinel costume a week after we see her take it off for what we all assumed would probably be for the last time. And I'm just really excited to see her back in action. And she's going to be there with, obviously, all the characters from The Flash, as well as Javicia Leslie's Ryan Wilder, Batwoman, um... Adam, Ray Palmer's Adam, as well as Ryan Choi, who I can only assume they're bringing the two of them together to maybe pass the mantle. I'm not sure, but still, it's like this big question of where is Ryan Choi's place in, in all of this? Because he's, he's not shown up since Crisis, so it's like, okay. And then also Mia Queen, uh, which I'm really excited to see back. Obviously, I talked about it last year, but I loved the Green Arrow and the Canaries backdoor pilot, and I wanted so bad for it to become a series on the CW, but obviously they passed on it, but they're bringing her back, and I'm so excited to see her again, um, and then there's, uh, I, th I think multiple other characters as well, like Damian Dark is going to be in it, uh, Eobard Thawne is going to be in it, just a lot, and, and Black Lightning, I totally forgot, Black Lightning is also going to be in it as well, which is just really cool, so I'm pretty excited about it, and I know that people are already freaking out online, thinking, oh my god, what does this mean for Kara, what does this mean for her uh, endgame, you know, in the, in the series, what does that mean for her ending, and a lot of people are like, oh, well, that means she's going to the future, but honestly, I just would discount any, any crossover that you know, don't take that as a indication that Kara is going to the future or whatever, because Superman's not going to be in this either. So it's like, people are like, well, you know, if, if Kara's on Earth, like, why wouldn't they have her come help? Well, Superman's not helping either. And actually, there are no aliens so far slated to be in uh, this crossover. So it could be something where they just need human heroes because alien heroes maybe get brainwashed or something. I don't know. But I think it's it, there's going to be like a bigger conceptual reason as to why both Kryptonians are not going to be in this crossover. Uh, more so than just, oh my god, it's going to spoil the ending for Supergirl. Because I don't think that's the case. Um, but that was, so that was some really exciting news that we just got. Um, I cannot wait to see that. And I it'll be just really nice to have another week 
to like have more Alex Danvers content <laughs> and especially to get to see her interact with um, Ryan Wilder. That's going to be really exciting. So I can't wait. I'm really excited for that. And I'm so happy that Kyler was was uh, cool enough to like stick around Vancouver, you know, and, and decide to to continue to play Alex for just at least a couple more episodes. So it's pretty cool. There's not much news coming out, so that's kind of all I got. Anyway, though, let's get into Supergirl 608. Welcome back, Kara. If you forgot, in case you missed it, in case you forgot because it's been months, Kara just returned from the Phantom Zone, and that is where we left them all off after everybody's encounter with phantoms and with those, like, phantom dreams. Those get brought up brought up a lot in this episode as well as like phantom attacks and Kara's time in the phantom zone. So just a quick re reminder that all of that happened. <laughs> and we kick off the episode with Brainy on comms with Lena clearly competing, completing a very important mission. Get Kara's cake back to the tower safely. <laughs> this scene, I think this is the perfect way to bring this show back from hiatus because it was like so wholesome. It was brainy. He was in like this like newsies hat and like a leather jacket and he's carrying this cake and he's like weaving in and out of people. It just felt very like rom com very like campy. And I just really thought that was a really fun way to, like, reintroduce us to, or, you know, uh, not necessarily, not reintroduce, but to, like, kind of bring us back into Supergirl after this hiatus. And he brings it back to the tower safely. They thought that he was going to eat the cake, so they made him get there early. <laughs> and they do say, though, that apparently Kara just basically, like, collapsed upon entry to the tower after the, like, quick little hugs that that we got um at the end of 607 she basically just like collapsed to the ground her and Zorel, and so they were able to uh they had to put her under sun lamps for a while and so she's been sleeping and so then we cut to Kara and we see flashes of Kara's time in the Phantom Zone and Kara wakes with a start from her nightmare and Alex is there and she's trying to comfort her but Kara is like, I don't want to talk about it, just, you know, don't, don't. And Alex does not push and they hug and Kara very brokenly says, Alex, can I have another hug please? And it was just, oh my god, it was so heart shattering. And I think this episode was so interesting and in that it really gave us Kara at, like, her most emotionally vulnerable, which I really appreciated because it's something that we've all been wanting to see from Kara for so long, see her trauma talked about, see her trauma discussed. And honestly, this episode kind of reminded me of the season three episode Triggers uh, with uh, Psy, which it was the first appearance of Psy in, on the show, and... It, it kind of reminded me of that where we're dealing with Kara's pain and her emotions all while seeing all of these things that truly like trigger her um, memories of the Phantom Zone and, and things like that. And also her trying to kind of like push away her feelings, but then finally letting it go and, and you know, talking about it with, with someone eventually, you know, but it we spend a lot of time this episode with Kara as she's pretending to be okay, but is clearly not. Um, so then, Kara, uh, Alex takes Kara into the main central area of the tower and she gets a round of hugs as she's welcomed back home by her friends. Jean hugs her and looks incredibly proud that she made it out. Brainy hugs her and he looks incredibly relieved. Nia hugs her and she she just looks at Kara with so much reverence that only someone glad to like have her friend and mentor back would. And then there's Lena. Guys, guys. <laughs> this is like super corp proof number 7485. Like and I mean God, her hug just stood out so different. Like, her moment with Kara just stood out so differently to me from the others. I mean, I just kind of, like, touched on what each person kind of looked like. So then we get to Lena. And, and before Kara can even hug Lena, she's got, like, tears running down her face. And 
she hugs Kara so tightly, and then Kara says that it's only because Lena's on the team that Kara is standing there. And Kara is the, or, sorry, Lena is the only person that Kara actually, like, reassures or even says anything to, like, you know, when they're hugging, when they're reuniting. And, and, and then they pull away. Oh, God. <laughs> then they pull away. And it looks like Kara, like, leans in. Like, what? What? And it's like, wh what? <laughs> Like, there is no way that, that that was not intentional for this, like, she, like, bodily leans in towards Lena and then, like, is kind of interrupted by Alex, who kind of, like, gets between them. But, like, it's when Lena pulls away and Kara kind of, like, goes with her as if there's, like, a string, you know, like, connecting them together and she's, like, tugged forward almost. And she just looks... I don't know. I just... The only answer is Super Corp Endgame. <laughs> At this point, that's the only thing that makes sense for that scene. Because, like, why else would each person's reaction be so different to Kara's return? Like, it each reflected their relationships with Kara so perfectly. And, and Lena's reaction implied just how deeply she cares about her and how deeply Kara cares about Lena in return. You know, I mean, like I said, you know, Nia's reaction was more of somebody, like, really welcoming back a mentor that they missed. Because she obviously went through so much while Kara was gone, trying to, like, discover herself and her powers. And so Kara coming back is, like, incredible because she finally has somebody to, like, ask questions to. Maybe not necessarily about her powers, but just about, like, being a hero and, and having somebody to look up to. And Brainy, I mean, you know, we all saw how devastated he was. And then he even tells Kara, I'm so glad I don't have to feel that way anymore because he's just relieved that Kara's home and that everything can calm down and he can, you know, be rational and, and, and they're smart, you know, caring friend again. And then the same thing with Jean, where he just looks so proud that Kara made it home. He looks so proud of his daughter, you know? And Lena, like, the the tears, the waterworks. And on Twitter, Jay uh, Fabier, is that how you say it? Fabier? Jay? The guy who wrote, the, one of the people that wrote the episode, and he's a producer on Supergirl as well, he tweeted that they actually had to reshoot the reunion scene because the original just, like, wasn't as emotional as they thought that it could be. Like, it just didn't work. And they said that their show was just, you know, it's about big emotional moments, and so the reunion needed to be more emotional. And I think that's very interesting that in their new, improved, big emotional reunion, Lena is the only one that is, like, crying. She's, like, so, like, the waterworks <laughs> you know and I, I think that's really interesting that that's the choice that they made while reshooting this for more emotion and more emotional depth to me super core bend game anyway <laughs> so Alex tells Kara that Kelly couldn't make it because she had a full day of orientation at social services which is now her new new which is now her new gig post obsidian um, and then also, I'm sure that that probably had a lot to do with Ozzy uh, preparing for her writing or at least spending time in the writer's room or whatever she had to do. I'm sure that that's probably the reason for her absence this episode. But obviously, I wish that we had seen Kelly. But next week's episode is going to feature Kelly and Kara very heavily working together, which is really exciting. But just wanted to like throw that out there. That's probably the reason why Kelly wasn't in this episode. And then Zor-El enters. He compliments Jean on his alien technology in the tower and says Kara has a wonder wonderful group of friends and then says he wants to see what his daughter has been up to on Earth before heading back to Argo City. Because, as we all forget, I forget a lot of the time that Kara's, like, family and, like, her whole entire, like, civilization is just, like, up in space, like, floating just as a city. Like, that Kara never goes to visit. It's fine. <laughs> Anyway, so we cut to Catco. Kara and Nia have brought Kara's Uncle Archie from Midvale to the office, and Kara says that she is surprised she still even has a job, <laughs> which I think, girl, that's how we all feel. I think we're all surprised all the time that you still have a job. 
<laughs> but Nia says that everything should be fine. She covered for Kara with Andrea, saying that she was off the grid with some kind of, like, resistance leader. Kara's like, what? And Nia just, like, whisks Uncle Archie away. And Andrea actually approaches Kara and is like, hey, where's my article? <laughs> But it's also revealed, too, in that scene where they have this, this, where they talk, um, that Kara's Pulitzer is still, like, a thing. She still has one. I don't know what she wrote about to get one, but she still has one. Because, you know, obviously, I think we were all concerned post-crisis that her Pulitzer got erased because, duh, she didn't have to write an expose about Lex. So it's like, well, what did she write about? Who knows? (laughs) It's still there, though, so that's nice. Um... Kara then reveals that there's no story. She says that this source, this resistance leader, took it all back. That resistance leaders can be so flighty. And then Andrea is back to being very mean to her. As she is. <laughs> and she holds a staff meeting where she says that CatCo is ranked number eight in the rankings of the top newspapers or whatever. And says that if they're not number one by next month she'll have a new staff. And it's like, oh, she's here with that Cat Grant meanness. And honestly, personally, I think that this is kind of how Andrea should have been utilized, like, from the beginning. Like, I don't think we really needed, like, much substance beyond... (laughs) Beyond... I mean, obviously, this is not me saying that that Akrata is not cool. I think she's very cool. Um... But I do just think that her kind of, like, stepping into those, like, Cat Grant being a mean boss shoes is, like, so wonderful. Because <laughs> it's a dynamic that I have missed from season one. Because obviously, Car and Cat just, like, you know, didn't click for, for most of season one. And then Car and Andrea still do not click. <laughs> and I think that... They did utilize her like that, but a lot of, like, her flack kind of went towards William, and I'm like, eh, you know, it could have just been, like, this really fun dynamic. And, obviously, she also had a lot of scenes with Lena, which, I mean, that's fine, too. Like, I, it's fine. <laughs> but I like this version of Andrea, where she just gets to be mean and sexy and walk around CatCo, and that's all she should have to do. <laughs> So after the meeting, Andrea uh, uh, pulls Kara aside and tell her, tells her that she was patient with her absence, but it resulted in exactly nothing. So now she wants her to get an exclusive with Supergirl about the Phantom Tax in National City and interview the victims, which is the first time Kara is actually hearing about any of this. She confronts Nia, but she tells her that they handled it and they didn't want her to worry. And Kara's first thought is that all these people suffered in National City because of me, because You were all trying to save me, so you let phantoms out of the phantom zone. And all these people got turned into phantoms, you know, and and it it weighs heavily on Kara, you can tell. And honestly, if CatCo can be like this all the time, I want more CatCo. I've been caught in 4K saying that um, I don't care about CatCo and that I could use less CatCo. But honestly, this, this, like, goofiness of, like, Kara and Andrea's headbutting and, like, Nia kind of, like, chasing after Uncle Archie, like, it's pretty great. I, I enjoyed the CatCo in this episode. And here's Flat Stanley. It's William. They squished, uh, Kara and William. They squashed it. They, they got rid of it. They KO'd it, which I was really excited about. I was really happy to see. Will, uh, William reveals that he's been seeing a pediatrician named Mary, and Kara and William's bro vibes are just much more welcoming and wonderful than whatever they were trying to do before. I'm really happy about this. <laughs> it's like, this episode checked so many boxes for me about, like, Supergirl returning. It was like, okay, we need, like, Super Corp content. Check. Got it. We want William and Kara gone. Check. Got it. <laughs> we want, you know, all of these things. And I'm like, yes, 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 they did it. Let's go. Um, so then Kara and zor stop a satellite from crashing into the Earth, but zor sees radioactive, radioactive trash that's hard to say, uh, from Luther Corp and the former DEO and, and then all of this, actually, all of this stuff that I've talked about happened before the title screen even hit, which I was like, oh my god, they've like, boom, 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 here's all kinds of stuff, and then, oh god, it's only just been like five minutes. (laughs) So one thread that continues throughout this episode is Andrea's upset, um, kind of like, meltdown about 
CatCo and CatCo's plummeting stocks. Uh, so she watches on the TV as, as those plummeting stocks are discussed. Uh, and when Kara enters to pitch a story about the trash island caused by Lex, Andrea takes that trash island story and gives it to William to cover and insists that Kara get that interview with Supergirl about the Phantoms, leaving Kara to confront her trauma head on. And as she's researching, she just keeps having these, like, PTSD flashbacks of the Phantom Zone. Zor-El reaches out to Kara at work, and she leaves to head to the tower. He tells her that the Earth's oceans are dying, and that Earth is on the path of Krypton. Jean enters to tell them the fire has reignited and that they'll have to be taken care of, though Kara says that it should have been part of the cleanup from when the DEO imploded, but Zor-El is insistent that Earth needs saving, like, ASAP. And one thing is that, like, clearly this episode is, like, you know, showcasing that Zorel, even in his, like, seemingly good intentions, is just trying to make up for the guilt that he has about Krypton, which is more, like, uh, on the nose a bit later in this episode. But um, he does tell Kara that he wants access to Krypton's records, so Kara takes him to the fortress to get them. And is it just me, or is the fortress, like, a different size every time we see it? <laughs> Like, they showed the shot of, like, the establishing shot of when um, Zor-El and Kara show up. And I'm like, they look tiny. Why do they look so tiny? The, the fortress is not that tiny. But apparently it is. I don't know. Anyway. Back at the tower, Nia runs into Lena and asks where Kara is because Andrea is asking for the article. <laughs> And it's like, if this episode is not just everybody being like, Kara should not have a job, like, <laughs> I don't know what is. But Lena ends up telling her that they went to the fortress, and Nia says that it's nice that they have that to do together. Nia says she'd give anything to spend another day with her mother, and Lena says that she'd give anything just to know her mother. They then discuss their fear dreams, and Lena says the, tel the Kelpie turned into her mom, and that's how she defeated it, and Lena calls Nia the dream expert, and genuinely, I love this friendship. I know we saw, in the last episode in particular, in 607, we saw them really bonding, and, and I love that they're, like, really committing to this friendship and to them discussing their families together and... and I just love that. I love these two. And obviously, Nicole and Katie's, like, natural friendship vibes and chemistry together just, like, read so well on screen. It's just really lovely. And obviously, it's great as fans of Lena to see her finally kind of step into the Super Friends as a true member and not just be, like, connected to Kara but not the other ones, you know what I mean? So it's really nice. And so in the fortress, Kara and Zorel discuss his missteps on Krypton, and call Kara calls him a hero, which is like, all right, continuity. But, but at the same time, I do understand that when you think your parents are dead, it's different when you think of their mistakes versus, like, when you find out they're alive again. And I think I've talked about this before, but, like, when you find out that people maybe you were disappointed uh, in are, like, actually alive, like, you might change your perspective on them. <laughs> you might not want to, like, waste that time that you never thought you would get on fighting over the past, which I think is kind of the path that they have Kara on. It's fine. So Zorel vows to not let what happened to Krypton happen to Kara's new home. He actually ends up apologizing to Kara as well, which, which I thought was really cool. She's, he says, look, I'm sorry that we messed up Krypton so bad that we had to, like, send you away. <laughs> and I'm sorry that we had to, that we had to send you away in the first place. Like, I'm, I'm sorry that we had to s abandon you. And it was really an interesting moment. But so Kara ends up actually having another flash of PTSD. And this is actually from when Lex sent her into the Phantom Zone the last time she was in the fortress. So she's not just having these Phantom Zone flashes, but like of all of the moments leading up to it as well. And then we see Kellex, who we haven't seen, this funky little guy. We haven't seen him in a long time, and I love him, and I love his his dynamic with Brainy in this episode. But we see him, and he's kind of like, he's got the answers. So we cut to Andrea and William, and Andrea says that he sounds like a human sleep aid, and I think that might be her most iconic line to date, and she's so right. Um, and then William tells her that, listen, they, Lex 
Luther Corp exploited a loophole in the system. So it's really the system's fault. Like it was all above board when they disposed of all this toxic waste. And Andrea says the unseen toxicity, toxicity of Lex is the fire. Figure it out. And I thought that was iconic. So at the tower, Alex is cataloging any other D DEO remnants that weren't properly disposed of when Brainy and Jean came back from putting out the fire. Uh, Kara and Zorel return as well with grim news, and Kara's like pushing aside her feelings still, you know, just about all of the uh, things that she's been through. And they actually brought Kellex back, except his name is Oscar now, named after Oscar the Grouch, and Brainy still has a pwn to pick with this guy. Apparently, Zorel rigged Oscar with Kaluan tech to shrink the garbage and absorb it, like absorb the energy or something, I don't know, and says that the melting pot of alien technology on Earth makes this a much more achievable rescue mission, like of saving the Earth, of saving the oceans. And Jean and Brainy are both concerned about the use of this alien tech and combining it, but they let it happen, though. And Oscar will be recalled at the first sign of distress. That is Jean's uh, uh, caveat with this whole thing. And he seems to be working well. This episode, honestly, towards, like, kind of the middle and the end, turns into, like, a really tech-heavy episode. So a lot of the tech I'm just gonna kind of, like, brush over because it's like, whoop, okay. <laughs> but back at Catco, Andrea is spiraling about the continuing decline of the stocks and of Catco's reputation. It seems to be all like crashing down around her, like today. But anyway, and she uses her Akrata smoke power to phase into Luther Mansion, and she actually sees that William was telling the truth about Lex's above board disposal of DEO shit, but she actually sees profiles on the super friends and listen <laughs> lex has kara's full alien name on that paper and andrea still can't piece together like her employee kara danvers is <laughs> is the spitting image of kara zorel except she wears glasses and <laughs> and they have the same name and she still does not know. And it's like, oh my god. <sighs> anyway, so with Oscar, he is just doing his little job when garbage actually starts to attach itself to him. And they lose track of him under the water and Kara goes to find him, but not without the anti-kryptonite suit on. And I love that she just like press on that new crest on her suit and then it turns into the anti-kryptonite suit. Ugh, it's so good. <laughs> So at the tower, Lena is like, you lost a radioactive Kellex. <laughs> and Lena sits down and figures out this whole Oscar thing in like 10 seconds. She works with Brainy to figure out exactly what is going on, especially now that he's being cloaked by Daxamite technology. Because apparently, like, in all of this DEO garbage is just, like, insanely powerful alien technology that is currently attaching itself to Kellex. And Lena discovers that he, if he absorbs any more energy, he'll explode with the force of an atomic bomb. And Brainy says that they'll use a virus to shut him down. Zorel fights back against this, saying he can still fix him and save Krypton. Ouch. Um, Alex tells Brainy to get the virus ready and tells Zorel to either help or get out of the way, and he decides to help. Before the commercial break, we see Oscar as that giant trash monster from the uh, trailer that we got a couple weeks ago. So, I was kind of right. It technically was a Lex Luthor creation, except it was just all his garbage that got dumped. <laughs> Anyway, though, so the super friends arrive on the scene as Oscar makes landfall with Lena on comms at the tower with Zorel. Oscar apparently has like a force field now and everything, so they need to get Brainy close enough to release the virus. And he does this. He listen, listen to me. <laughs> I love Brainy more than words can describe. I love Jesse as Brainy more than words can describe. Apparently, in this like scene with uh him trying to taunt uh Kellex they just kind of like let Jesse loose they let him loose and they let him say kind of whatever he wanted like they had some taunts written in the script but he's uh Jay on Twitter uh said in his thread Jay Faber um who the producer that I mentioned earlier 
said that a lot of the lines that actually made it to the screen were Jesse's improvised lines, which is just really great. And, you know, it just goes to show that Jesse knows exactly what, like, the bread and butter of Brainy is. And it's his, like, quick wit and his, like, goofiness. And I just, I love it so much. I love it. I love Brainy. He says, Kellex, you stupid idiot. Can you hear me? <laughs> and then he says, he says, wow, look how big and dumb you are. <laughs> and then the, the best line, the like coup de gras. He says, you sorry excuse for a Roomba. <laughs> it's so good and so like it's enough to like get Oscar I guess angry enough or whatever I don't know what really he was trying to do but he gets like pulled into the trash you know and Kara and Jean fly up to help him but but Kara's suit gets breached and she's infected with kryptonite which only allows for more you know PTSD phantom zone flashes and Alex ends up having them too like she <laughs> Alex like uh, she sees Kara go down and she has these flashes of Kara being like sucked away into the phantom zone you know and I think that was really a really cool in inclusion where okay we can see now that yes Kara is heavily traumatized from her experience in the phantom zone but also Alex, you know, has the same PTSD and the same trauma and the same emotional um, reaction that, that Carr has been having, but just being on the other side of the equation, you know? And I think that was really, really important for Alex and Kara in this episode. So Alex starts shooting at it, and then Nia protects everybody with a dream shield, but they do get blasted back. Brainy is able to deploy the virus, and Oscar falls. And then hearing Lena on comms is just everything. I love that she is, I mean, I'll say it a million times. I love that she's just, like, fully incorporated into the Super Friends. I just adore it. Um, <laughs> and so Brainy emerges from the rubble and tells Kellex he meant every word of those insults. <laughs> And Kara then takes the trash monster and throws him into the sun. And I love the parallel from the season two finale when she yeeted Monel into the sun. She did the same thing here. <laughs> Both of them trash monsters. <laughs> So back at the tower, Kara and Zorel talk, and Zorel tells Kara that he needs to head to Argo uh, to finally face her mother. And he tells her that he is scared uh, because of his shortcomings on Krypton. He thought maybe if he could fix Earth, then he could finally face Allura, you know? And, and I think, I mean, God, this scene sounds so familiar because it's like, he says, if I could just fix Earth... I could earn my way back to her. And and if we all remember season five premiere, if I could be Kara, just Kara. Like, it just sounds similar, you know? Like, that declaration of, like, love, but of being so shameful about what you did out of love. Especially if it wasn't the right choice to make, you know? And I, I just think that that was a really cool Super Court parallel. So then he tells her that she doesn't have to carry the weight of the world on her shoulders. He says that even though she's Kryptonian, it's okay to be human. And another thing, this line, like this speech from Zor-El is kind of packed with, for me, Supercorp Endgame, as well as like the crushing defeat of Caramel that is never going to happen. Um, because he says all of this and it, it called back to season two when... Uh, Monel said that Kara looked beautiful with the weight of the world on her shoulders, and yet here's her dad saying, you don't have to carry the weight of the world on your shoulders. You don't have to. It's okay to let it go. And, I, like, again, like, just those starkly different messages that I think are kind of just, like, the infinite nails in the caramel coffin <laughs> and I know like for me I never thought that they would ever do caramel again but I know that a lot of people have been really nervous especially since Chris Wood showed up in the images on set he's going to be in the finale him Jeremy Jordan and McCod are all going to be in the finale I didn't expect anything different personally but um people have been concerned about like oh my god what if they do Cara and Monel like what if they do that I, they won't they won't. 
I'm like so confident in that, that they will not do that because it just, like I said, these messages are so contradictory and there's no erasing it because the show, it's not like the show retconned how bad mon was to Kara. They had Kara acknowledge how bad mon was to Kara and how bad mon was to Brainy, you know? So it's, it's, all of that stuff is still canon. So why would they purposefully like have this direct comparison between what her dad wants for her and what her ex-boyfriend wanted for her, you know? And the same thing goes for him saying, like, even though you're a Kryptonian, it's okay to be human. Monel was the one who pushed her to be Supergirl. She's like, uh, well, if I'm Supergirl and if I if I have Supergirl and I have you, then then that's okay. You know, like if I'm just Supergirl and I can date you, then that's great. Because that's what Monel wanted her to be. He wanted her to be this, like, perfect Kryptonian girl. Except Kara is Kryptonian, but she's also human. Like, she spent so much time on Earth that she is human. And so I, I just don't think that they will push on that contradiction. You know what I mean? Like, that they will ignore that contradiction. On the contrary, though, Lena, who actually ends up walking into this scene... Um, Lena has always allowed Kara to be human. Like, always. Always has allowed Kara to be human. I mean, that was what Kara's speech to her in season five was about. Her saying, I just wanted to be Kara. Like, I didn't want to be Supergirl. I didn't want to be, you know, uh, this, like, Kryptonian, this superhero that everybody looks at. I wanted to be your human friend, and I wanted that to be enough, and I, and I was selfish for it, you know? And, and so for Lena to be the key to, to Kara's humanity, for him to say that, and then her to walk into that scene and say, she tells him, like, Brainy has set up the portal to Argo, it's like, what? <laughs> I mean, like, they could have had any other character deliver that message, but no. Like, they could have had Brainy deliver that message. They could have been like, he could have, you know, come up and said, hey, Zorel, I've got the portal ready, or, you know, I've got it ready for you to go to Argo. But no, it was Lena who delivered the message for Brainy, who walks into the scene right when Zorel says, it's okay to be human. And it's like, oh my god. And I know that they also kind of wanted to just, like, hammer home the idea of, like, family, especially biological family, because Lena's going on this journey with her mother. But, I mean, they could have, they, they've been doing that with Nia for the entire episode. I don't think they needed that moment with zor to really, like, hammer that home. I mean, it worked, you know, it, it, it didn't hurt that they had it, but like I'm saying, you know, I feel like there was also an ulterior reason for having that scene, and I think it was to highlight Supercorp and the connection that they share. At CatCo, Andrea published William's article with a picture of Oscar and everything, but then Andrea says that they need a new angle. They don't want to talk about who's attacking they want to talk about who's stopping it, because apparently nobody else is covering superheroes in this entire city. Everybody's just covering the monsters, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, so he says Supergirl and her friends, and Andrea says super friends. It's like, oh shit, she, she coined it. She coined super friends. <laughs> Super Friends is canon. It was coined by Andrea Rojas. I mean, well, it has been said on the show before, but she's going to publish it for the first time. And I think that's so cool because it's such a cool comparison to season one when Kat, Co when Kat and Kat Co <clears throat> coined the name Supergirl. And now five years later or six years later, God, sorry, six years later in canon, six years later. The show is is saying, look, now the now the same publication is going to name her group that we've built over the six years. It's just really cool and satisfying. So Andrea tells William that the, her his new mission is to track their every move, write profiles on all of them, and make sure they call Catco first always. And I'm obviously, I'm sure that this is going to be what leads him to finding out Kara's identity. That's fine. I don't care. At this point, I genuinely don't care. As long as they're not going to kiss, I'm cool. <laughs> as long as they're not going to kiss, I am fine. Um, 
So at Nia's apartment, she gets a call from Lena, who tells her that she just got off the phone with Kara. Um, <laughs> I love that they included that. Again, it's just very super corpy to me. Um, and she says that she wanted to tell Nia as well that she realized what the Kelpie means and that she's going to go to the place that she was born to find out information about her birth mother. And obviously, they didn't mention it on the show, but all of us are thinking that she's going to Ireland <laughs> because Katie has stopped trying with her American accent and Lena, you know, they gave Lena... The middle name Kieran, even though it's a guy's name, is what they said before. But it's an Irish, it's an Irish middle name, or it's an Irish name. But anyway, she's going to Ireland, <laughs> which is why she will not be in next week's episode. But I'm totally cool with that. It's fine, whatever. It's gonna be a Kelly episode anyway, which I'm really excited about. But um, I am interested to see like how they play this whole thing of like Lena's mission of self-discovery because if she comes back in episode 10 just like magically having magic I'm gonna be a little like wait girl where did you go <laughs> or like what what but also I think that Lena going off to find her answers about her birth mother and like you know, all of the things to do with, like, water and the Kelpie and everything like that. I'm really happy because I think it means that it's pretty much confirmed that Nixley is not Lena's mom. So I'm really happy about that just because it would have been so ridiculous. It would not have made any sense. And and people were just like, well, who else could, be, could it be? I don't know, unnamed Katie McGraw in a wig. Like, that's, <laughs> that's who it's gonna be. Um, but anyway, I'm just really happy about that. So... At Kara's apartment, though, she's trying to write her article about the Phantoms, which Andrea probably doesn't even want at this point, <laughs> uh, when Kara decides to open up to Alex about the Phantom Zone. She says that every breath felt like ice and that she doesn't want to be alone anymore. She says she was so focused on getting out that she didn't let herself process what she went through. And she tells she asks Alex, like, what if that fear never goes away? And Alex tells Kara that when she thought Kara was never going to come back, she was thinking about ending it all. Like, that's how far they go with Alex in this scene, which I was really surprised about. Like, this is a show, you know, that does not go that deep, like, very often. But they were like, yeah, you know, Alex was gonna end it. And it's like, holy shit. And, and she says that she felt hopeless. Even today, during the fight, she talks about, you know, how scared she is of losing Kara again. She says she fears that Kara could let, just, like, slip away at any moment. And, and then she says, though, that they'll get through this together. And, Kara, and she says healing together. Kara then name drops Iris and says that she needs to follow her lead and write her piece about how the city came together after an attack and Alex says she's brave and they're just the cutest and I love them. Uh, I love this scene. I think that Kyler and Melissa did such a wonderful job of like really like honing in on the emotions while also keeping it light and keeping it like keeping it how we know it between the Danvers sisters, you know, like, it's so second nature to them at this point that it's just so wonderful to watch. It's just like watching them in their element, you know, and so I just really, I loved this scene. I loved it. It was great. And honestly, for me, this also squashed any fear of Kara leaving for the future because she would never leave Alex, like, especially after this entire episode was about her finally being home with her family and saying over and over and over again that Earth is her home and that the super friends are her uh, her home and her family, like, there's no way that she's gonna just, like, run off to the future. Like, I think that that's squashed. So we got a lot of squashed. We got, things got squashed this episode that I think were really reassuring for me about the rest of this season. Um, William and Kara, squashed. Caramel, squashed. Kara going to the future. Squashed. <laughs> Super Corp. Endgame. Like, <laughs> there's no, there's no other way to say it. Like, <laughs> um, so then as the, at, as the episode comes to a close, we are at Nia's place and it's storming and she's having a dream and she wakes with a start and says, <gasps> Nixley. And it's like, ah, dreamer, what did you dream? Dreamer. What did you dream? <laughs> and that is the end of this episode. It was really, really wonderful. I loved this episode. I think it was really fun. 
like I said, it just felt really campy. It felt really, like, back in their element. Like I've been saying about some of the episodes in season six, I think that they're really hitting their stride with these episodes, and w- which, I mean, about damn time, but... <laughs> I don't know what happened in season five, because for season six, I'm getting season four vibes, which is just really wonderful. So, I'm loving it so far. Let me know what you think, how you're enjoying it, how did you like this episode, what did you think about some of these, like, super corp scenes, or what was your impression of, like, them squashing William and Kara so quickly? Did you like zor I liked zor I kind of thought he was a little fun. I'm glad he's gone, but... I thought he was he was fun to have around for a minute, you know, um, especially as Uncle Archie. He was like the charming version that Monel should have been. Like he was what Monel should have been at Catco instead of like screwing Eve in the closet. Like he should have just like been picking up like Xerox printers. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so I really loved this episode, though the only disappointing thing was that afterwards there was no promo for the next episode. Uh, supposedly this is what happened to Black Lightning earlier this year in their final season. The CW stopped just, like, releasing promos for them, which is really upsetting. I hope that this is not a trend that continues through Supergirl's final season, but we will have to see. Um, they didn't do it this time, so (laughs) hopefully... Hopefully next week they will. We'll see. But uh, like I said, Lena's not going to be in the next episode. The next episode heavily focuses on Kelly, her new role as a social worker, and building up to Guardian, which is really exciting. And I'm really thrilled to see this episode. And actually, screener like uh, uh, reviewers have already seen the episode. They've already seen screeners of 609s and and. I think the reaction has been pretty positive, so I'm excited about that. I'm excited to talk about it, but, um, that is, that is all that I have for this, for this week. Um, thank you guys so much for listening. Let me know what you think in the comments below if you're listening on YouTube, or if you're not, you can tweet me at TelevisedPod and let me know what you think, um, and I will be back next week for Supergirl Season 6, Episode 9. Bye!